You know, the New Testament, we have uh, Paul speaking to Timothy, telling him to be ready in season and out of season. Uh, and, and, and man, I, I'm just, I'm learning so much about myself. And, you know, you think I would, you think I'd understand the ways of me, you know, at, at uh, 52 years old, but um, I don't know all that God has set before me. And I don't know all the circumstances that I'll walk into but being ready in season and out of season is um, something that sounds so simple. And, you know, I, I, I can remember you know, going back uh, 20 years and being in uh, like a pastoral internship thing and, and you know, spending a, a grip of time and, and just gaining and learning ministry experience. And, you know, studying the pastoral epistles and, and having this verse, you know, be taught to me, and you know, one of those things that you just, you just plant within your heart, and it's like, okay, I got that, yeah, man, I, I got it, and, and, and everything becomes so uh, mechanical, oh, I got a verse for this, and oh, I got a verse for that, and oh, oh you know, all of these things, and, and you, you know, you're, you're like this little uh, walking little Bible answer man that you can just pull a, a, a verse out of, of uh, you know, just at a moment, and, and there it is, and, and I could do that so well, man. Uh, but I didn't have the heartstrings that were attached behind it. And in more recent um, years, um, I found that being ready in season and out of season is more difficult. And, you know, the, the, the preparation side of what I've come to learn is that it's not a day of study, it's not a week of study, it's a lifetime of study. It's what God has set before me in the entirety of my life and what he's called me to walk with him. And, and the same is true with you. You know, when I was younger, a, a younger Christian, I would see my grandfather uh, on my mom's side. He was a Pentecostal preacher. And, and I, I, I know that he would call me Jeffrey Boy. Jeffrey Boy, it doesn't matter how old I was. Jeffrey Boy, you know. Um, <clears throat> I, I can always remember him just always bringing in the fragrance of, of the scriptures just all the time. But, but, but it's like I never, I never really saw him sit and, and study the Bible. And that was always like troubling to me and, and, and all that stuff. And, and, and what I've learned is, is that he was a man with a tremendous prayer life. You know, things that I didn't see, things that I didn't know. And I was, I was so... Um, I was so mechanical in my Christian walk, and I was so narrow in my Christian walk that, man, I thought that, that you know, if you didn't have a Bible in your backpack and you couldn't you know, open it up and know the address of where you were going, it's just like, oh, are you really a pastor? You know, what are you? And, and, and hear me. I've just come to see that that is just so the wrong way to walk, to live, to be. And some of you that are pastor's kids, you know, you know, outside of my own, uh, you, 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 know, you know what I'm talking about. Being ready in season and out of season. And when you're down, uh, it doesn't mean that you're out of the game. It just means that there's something new that God is doing within the framework of your life. It, 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 quite frankly, it could mean that you're, 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 you're dead on. You're in the right spot. And I love that about God, about how, how God is, is able to do those things that are beyond the scope of our eyes, but we don't always understand that. In Psalm 77, verse number two, they'll, they'll put part of this on the screen, and I, I think I gave them the wrong translation for this, so maybe I'll just read it out to you. Psalm 77, verse two, coming from the NLT. The psalmist writes, he says, when I was in deep trouble, I searched for the Lord. Don't we do that? But listen to what he says. He says, all night long I prayed with hands lifted towards heaven, but my soul was not comforted. I think of God and I moan, overwhelmed with longing for his help. Down, but not out. I wish that the walk of walking with Jesus was easier sometimes. I wish that, I, I, I wish that the, uh, the, the, the messages and, and, and that, 
that every season that we walk through it, every passage of scripture that we come across, I wish it was all just, yes, it was, it was just all some of those, you know, those, those high passion moments where you, you, you see just the exuberance of joy just spilling out of the text. And yet in reality, as we search the scriptures, that's just not the case. And, 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 and through the Psalms, you can see what I like to call the, the bleeding heart syndrome, be it from David or, or from other psalmists, that you can, just, you can just see it. You can just see the pain spilling out of them. And, and you may be in a season right now uh, where, where you know, you know maybe, maybe you've had your hands lifted to God in a place of prayer and, and all this, but, but you don't see God answering your prayers. In fact, it's been not days, not weeks, not months, but maybe years Maybe some of it has been decades that you have walked through and you, you, you just don't understand. And, and, and yet what is, what is on the inside of you is not to, it's not to give up on God because you know that God is good. You know, where else are you going to go? You know, there's nowhere else to go. You, you know that. But it's so difficult that, that, that sometimes the struggle is real. And, and in that struggle, it just, it drains the life out of you. You can, you, can, you can see struggle. You can read about the Apostle Paul in the situation that he went through as, you know, as, as he's on uh, you know, death row, as he's you know, as fixing to lose his life. He gives you know, a deathbed writing to young Timothy in 2 Timothy. You can see these things as, it's, you know, as, as the picture is painted in, in, in Philippians, the book of joy and, and, and the struggles that were happening. And it doesn't mean that there's not joy there, but it doesn't mean that it's not it's not overshadowed or tainted or has, or has flecks of sorrow that were in it. And so we can see it. We can feel it. And when God doesn't allow your trial to pass by quickly and he allows it to linger, it can be some of those things that impact us in the strangest way. And yet, what is God up to within your life? You might be down, but you're not out. Uh, Matthew 24 and 12 is on the screen here for us. And this is, this is uh, Jesus speaking to his boys about the end times. And he says this. He says, sin will be rampant everywhere. Do you feel like that? Do you, do you, do you, I mean, do, do you just, do you, do, you, do you just, does your little heart and your little mind just look around your culture and go, man, I see that. What happens? That the love of many will grow cold. You know, for years I've looked at this as though Oh, you loser Christian, it gets hard, you can't even walk and, and still love people. What's wrong with you? You know, why can't you keep going? It's the Greek word, uh, soko. Sounds like so cold. <laughs> but it's grow cold. And, and uh, while I've mentioned it here from this pulpit a couple times in the years gone by, to grow cold just... It's, it's, it's this. Let me, let me demonstrate it for you, okay? Watch. Here it is. Don't, don't miss it. <sighs> Did you catch it? It's a sigh. It's, it, 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 it's, it's that, 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 that exhale of like, oh, man, who just popped my balloon? <laughs> it's a feeling of decrease in vigor or power to grow cold. It doesn't mean that there's any less of a walk with Jesus. It doesn't mean that it's a sinful thing. But quite honestly, it squarely means that, 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 that the heart is in tune with the times and, and, and that you can see the overshadowing over the day in such a way as is that, that it, it's, 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 it's beyond this, this, this mental battle, but it has penetrated the walls of the heart to be like, God, how much longer will you leave us in this situation? How much longer before you make things right? What are those struggles that you have? What are those prayers that you have that, that, that have been lingering there that you just wonder, is, is, should I even stop just praying about all this now? You know, God, you have an answer to these things. And it's been so many years well, this brings us to our very first idea, uh, flipping now to Psalm uh, 42. And our first idea of the morning is hard spiritual times. 
Psalm 42, I'm going to bounce back and forth between the, the New Living Translation and the New King James Version. Um, and so in Psalm 42, picking up in verse number one, he says, as the deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, O God. I, I thirst for God, the living God. When can I go and stand before him? Day and night, I have only tears for food while my enemies continually taunt me, saying, <laughs> where is this God of yours? My heart is breaking as I remember how it used to be. I walked among the crowds of worshipers, leading a great procession, procession to the house of God, singing for joy and giving thanks amid the sound of a, of a great celebration. God, we pray that you bless your word to our understanding and that you would encourage our hearts with deep truth and not emotional truth. That you would give us deep understanding within our soul of your faithfulness and that you would help us to build upon the rock this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Down but not out. And here we come in these first handful of verses here and we find hard spiritual times. You know, the psalmist found that, that the essentials of, of his life were we're being impacted. You know, in verse number one, he talks about panning for the water brooks. In verse number two, he says that he was, you know, his soul was thirsty for God. In verse number three, he says that his, his tears has been his food day and night. Think, think, think about the, the, the pictures that is behind this, that the essential things that, that, that pertain to life, breath and drinking and nutrition, eating, of course, and, 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 and why all of this, why all of his natural capacities were aimed towards God. It's like he didn't find that God was meeting those basic needs right there. And as much as he needed breath, he was panting. He was longing for God. He was thirsting for God. But he was feasting on frustration. Have you ever experienced that within your life? Have you ever experienced what this psalmist is writing about here in your life? You know, I'm just a man. And when it comes to those times, uh, those segments of, of my Christian walk where, where you know, I'm in these zones, you know, it seems like trying to alleviate discontentment can be a process where, where we as people, where our humanity comes out, and it's like, man, I'm trying to satisfy this with activity. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to satisfy this with more stuff. And we go to this place to where we, you know, we, we step out to these places, and uh, some have said we go coveting. We go window shopping. We go shopping. <laughs> you know, coveting. It's a coveting trip, you know. We eat more. You know, maybe you become a foodie, you know, to, to try to put away the things. And, you know, next thing you know, you're, you know, all of a sudden you've got your COVID-20 back, you know. Uh, we go on getaways, on vacations. We, again, we try to busy our life. We try, to, we try to do these things to keep plodding away. Some of these obviously have a negative slant on them. But, but we try to keep moving in, in, in such a way as that, yeah, I'm okay, I'm all right. It's going to be, and we, we just keep plodding away. I, I, I think there's something to be said about continuing to take steps forward, you know, that you, don't, that you don't just crash, that you don't just give up for sure. And I think we're going to see this psalmist as, as he does that. But on, on his journey and what is laid out here within Psalm 42, Psalm 43, we, 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 we come to this place and we all of a sudden, verse 3, take a look at it, this, the, the, the second half of it, is that the people around his life, they just made matters worse. They continually say to me, where is your God? Where is your God? You know, think about Job's friends. You know, think about, you know, the, the most miserable counselors in the world were Job's friends, you know. They were, they, they were there. They were just trying to find something. Okay, Job, if you really were a righteous guy, then all of these things wouldn't happen to you. You know, your, 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 your finances, your family, your health, none of these things would be impacted. And God was well pleased with Job. Why did God allow Job to walk through that? 
Because he was doing something greater in Job's life. Because while Job might have been down, he wasn't out. And when we're with God, when you and I, when we stand with Jesus, when we walk with Jesus, when we know Jesus, that no matter what it is that we face, when we understand it, when we don't understand it, when we see victory, when we see defeat, that God is with us and we are to be ready to be poured out in season and out of season. When you, when you feel like staying married. Now, don't write me and say, is there a problem with your marriage? No, my marriage is in a great place, okay? So uh, please don't, don't think that I'm, I'm speaking that. But I'm speaking that and I'm sharing that with you. When you don't feel like being married, when you don't feel like going to your job, when you don't feel like going to church, when you don't feel like being a part of the body of Christ, when you don't feel like even just you know, leaving the four walls of your house because what is the next, you know, what's the next pile of junk that you're going to run into? What is the next stuff that is going to happen? Where is your God, they said to him. And Job's miserable counselors, they kept pressing him, man. Dude, just confess your sin and get right with God. Verse four says this, he says, he says, when I remember these things, I pour out my soul within me for I used to go with the multitude. I went with them to the house of God with a voice of joy and praise with the multitude that, that kept a pilgrim's feast. You know, uh, man, when I, got, when I first got saved and Jody and I would go to church, it was Horizon Christian Fellowship. And, and, and we were unstoppable in those, it seemed like the first two, three, four, five years of, of our Christian walk. It was like every time we came into the, the sanctuary and, and, and we were just going through, uh, you know, the time of worship and all that stuff, it was, it was just, it was so expressive. It was so just what we needed and, and we sensed and we felt the spirit of God in, in such a heavy way and, and it was like, oh man. And, and for a guy that, that, that you know, grew up never crying and, and, and conditioning my heart, my mind, my emotions not to cry, then suddenly hands lifted a high. I don't even know why I did that. I just saw other people doing it. So, oh, this is what we do, you know, and I'm, I'm lifting up my hands like that, and I feel God. I sense the Holy Spirit around me, and I, yeah, I would just, I would just cry. My eyeballs would sweat, I think is what somebody once said. My eyeballs just would begin to sweat. You remember those moments maybe in your Christian walk where, well, that describes your experiences. You were with the people of God. You were going to the house of God. And at just those right times, you would celebrate God in such a special way. It was just so powerful. He was wrestling with that. He was, he was looking at this in a past tense because the moment that he was walking through, he wasn't experiencing, he wasn't experiencing that. And while he was panting and while he was hungering for God and while, 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 while he wanted things to be right, while he was eagerly doing the right thing, he just, he just wasn't feeling it. Take a look at the screen, Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 10. Solomon, is in, in his later years, when he got spoiled and went off the rails, he had moments of great wisdom, and he says this, Ecclesiastes 7 and 10, he says, he says, do not say, why were the former days better than these? For you do not inquire wisely concerning this. Don't, 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 don't look back to the, to the former days as though God is not with you present now today. Don't look back to the former days and always long to go back. Well, I remember when I lived in this town. I remember when these were my friends. I remember this. You know, this week, um, today is Sunday. I am so lost on my days. Um, on Wednesday night service, if you were here on Wednesday night service, you, you, you heard me say this, um, that Jody and I, uh, we, we, don't clap your hands on this, uh, Jody and I, we, we, we celebrated 31 years of marriage on uh, Monday, Tuesday, Tuesday of this week. And we did this little day trip up to Breckenridge and all that stuff. Uh, and and, and it, was, it was so cool. 
but we revisited some songs of our past. We listened to some country music from our past. That left me so depressed. <laughs> uh, I had a point I was going to make, but I forgot what it was. <laughs> Do not say, why were the former days better than these? For you do not inquire wisely concerning this. I remember. It's because why the songs that we were listening to were celebration of love. The next couple days, I started thinking about my family. I haven't seen my family, my brothers, my sisters, my mom, my dad, my extended uh, family, my cousins, and all this stuff. And uh, uh, most of them are ingrained into uh, country music and the country way of living. And it just made me flash back to, uh, to those areas. But the Bible says, do not say why were the former days better than these, for you do not inquire wisely concerning this. And some of you still have a huge problem with this. Some of you are, are here in church, but you're living there in your heart, your mind, your emotions, your thoughts. And you need to stop. You need to come out of the days of old. You need to put away those things and to realize what God has laid right before you. Because this family that is right around you right now in, in this moment, these, the, the, the people in the body of Christ, the, these folks, you may know them, you may not know them, that they will be more a part of your future. And unless your natural family is saved, you won't have a future with them. It's done. It's over. That's a hard truth sometimes for believers in Jesus to swallow down, primarily newer believers in Jesus or immature believers in Jesus. But God will take you through that. And his longing for natural things, it didn't help him. And it won't help you and it won't help me. Why? Because you and I are designed to live life by focusing on what lies ahead, not focusing on the suffering, not focusing on the setback. That God wants us to make progress. He doesn't want us to get stuck in our yesterdays. And I'm so staggered. I think I came into the house on, on Thursday at some point and I shared with Jody, I said, I just, I, I have to sit down. I said, I cannot believe what these songs have put me into in an emotional state of just thinking about my family. I'm not telling you it's wrong to think about your family. I, I don't mean it like that. But I mean it by when you get stuck in such a way of things that you cannot change that it halts your progress to go forward, then I believe that we're squarely out of line with what God has for us. Take a look at the screen, Philippians chapter 4, verses 8 and 9. In fact, I should read this one from the screen. Paul says, and he, sa he says, and now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. He says, fix your thoughts on what is true. Y you know, can, can you catch that this morning? Fix. If you had a flat tire on your car, what would you do with it? Just walk over to it and just kick it? It's flat. Why do, why, why do people kick flat tires? It's flat. You can see it's flat. Stop kicking the tire, you nerd. <laughs> you can call somebody to fix it. You know, phone a friend. No, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to drive on a flat tire to discount tire, and then I'll have to buy tires and rims. Yeah, I'll ruin them both. If we understand how to fix a flat tire, Maybe when the air goes out of our thinking, we can grab hold of this. Fix your thoughts on what is true. Honorable, right, pure, lovely, admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. And I love this because the thinking leads to the doing. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me. Everything you heard from me and saw me doing uh, then the, the God of peace will be with you. 
that Paul, in, 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 in a very miserable condition there in Philippians, that he had the presence of mind to encourage other peoples, even though his suffering was great in that moment. He was pointing them forward and so they wouldn't get paralyzed in the moment. And that, this is all about being ready in season and out of season. And the reason I speak to you about these particular things is so that you wouldn't think, and I believe that most of you don't think this, but, but some still think this, that I live in some type of a glass bubble that is insulated from the pains, the hurts, the traumas, the difficulty, the sorrow, the setbacks, and the frustration of life. Today, I wore my Elvis Presley shoes, my blue suede shoes. I've had them for years. They don't have many miles on them because I don't like them. It's a true story. My wife tells me this morning, getting ready, she says, you got so many shoes in there, I'm going to throw them away or sell them, I think is what she said. I'm wearing my blue suede shoes today. They've been sitting there for years, but I have them on today. I have no idea why I'm telling you that. I don't know even why we're given this particular vein of the message today other than, to, other than to say is that I felt encouraged by the Lord or from the Lord, from his word, and I was able to remember some of these things going through these psalms. And I, and I know that, that when, um, you know, the pastor is often in the forefront. He often... He often you know, he gets blasted before the body gets blasted. And so I know that if this was important for me to go through, that maybe this week is your week. But maybe you'll be armed this week as you move out into this week and all of those, those um, situations and feelings and circumstances arise before you. Maybe, maybe just one of you, you know, like that prison letter I showed you here at the beginning, maybe just one person will be impacted for something positive. Well, this psalmist, notice verse, um, verse 5 again, 42 and 5. He says, why am I discouraged? I'm in NLT. He says, why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? He says, I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again my Savior and my God. Now, I am deeply discouraged, but I will remember you. Let's stop right there for a moment. The psalmist moved into this particular place, you know, that, that, that he experienced some type of change. Something was happening in and around his world where there was an outside thing that, that just, it just hit him in such a way he couldn't control it and it tore his heart wide open. And he's doing nothing more than what I, I, I wish that more Christians would do. And that is speak about the reality, the reality of being discouraged. Not pretend when you come in the back of the church and you have your smile on and somebody asks you how you're doing and you say, oh, I'm yeah, good, how are you? you know, and you, just, and you just continue to move on. This psalmist you know, he, he didn't do that. He, he, he opened up his life. He expressed his feelings here, even if it is here for us to see written down. And he's torn between, between what he knows and how he feels. Have you ever been in that spot? Being torn between what you know God has said, but how you feel. You know, the longer that I walk with Jesus, the more I'm finding that this is the, this is the area where faith is developed, where faith matures. Because our feelings are not going to go away. We're going to have high feelings and low feelings. That's just part of life. We, we get that. But it's in the middle of those places that whether I'm high or I'm low, and, I, and I'm not just talking about a day where you just feel a little bit slow and melancholy. No, no, no. I, I, I'm talking about those, those days when the life is squished out of you. And I don't know how many people or how many lives that you guys are individually are involved in to where you feel the pain of other people. I can't tell you the face, and I won't tell you the name, but I'll tell you the situation. There are people 
that are regular attenders here, people that you have seen, families that you have seen, and you wouldn't know the length of suffering that they're going to. A woman that you have brushed elbows with many times over the course of this past week has fallen into a, a bad plight. A sickness just like that. And unless something radical happens overnight, the family, people you know, the woman you know, will have her life support taken away. And she goes into eternity. The reality of being torn between what I know about God and the feelings of why Proverbs 17 and 22 on the screen it says this it says that a cheerful heart is good medicine. But a broken spirit saps the person's strength. And there are, there are so many things that can impact us. And I stand up here and I stand before you with such a great privilege to have had the opportunity to do this for 12 years. I haven't always known what I'm doing. <laughs> I think this morning might be one of those mornings. I'm not quite sure what I'm doing. But I do know God. And I do know His faithfulness. And I do know His love. And I do know that we're at the end of the age. And I do know that so many people They play Christian. They have a saved soul and a wasted life. And the preacher man is the man that, is, that God uses to point people back to the reality of the moment, the sobriety. What are the stupid things in your life that have separated relationships? What are the things that have... That have broken your spirit and sapped your strength? Has it been the plights and the pains of other people? Has it been the, has, has it been the, the unkind words or the unnecessary hurts or the, or, the, or the people that you've locked arms with in your life, in your world that have, that, that, that have reached a point that says, this is too hard, I'm not doing this no more, and they dump you like a rock and they walk out on you? Do you, do you understand the pain? Do you understand what, 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 what washes over you when, when a, a, a month, five weeks ago, we had the gal from this fellowship that right before her husband, 38 years old, stuck a gun to her, 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 her face and killed herself right before him. Somebody that was attached to this fellowship. Do you understand that we just had a national night out here and we had these officers come in here and, and be with us? But do you see what in real time is happening to one of our fellow officers right, right here in this city? It's on video. The city released it. A gal that was so just see she was just so depressed officers doing whatever he could in the second in the middle of traffic to try to work with her and to get her to say something and she pulls a gun on him and he, he has to take her life right just right down right here right just, 
And the officer completely falls apart in the, in, in the moments following that. The psalmist was speaking of the reality of being discouraged and being torn by circumstances that he couldn't affect. He knows what the truth is, but he was longing for God to do something greater. And he was in this place where he felt like he was completely isolated, that... that, that, that I'm out of fellowship with God because I can't hear God and yet he might very well be in fellowship with God. That he was out of fellowship with those others that he had walked to the house of God and worshiped and, and celebrated. He was out of fellowship with them. Verse two, verse four. Two was God, verse four was people. And a broken spirit. As the, as the proverb says, it saps a person's strength. This morning, as I share these things, there are notes, but uh, the vast majority of what I've shared with you is not written. I'm just speaking to it, speaking it to you in the moment. If you desire to take some notes, maybe I'll just give you three things here that, that can bring a discouraged soul. You know, maybe it's not in the exact vein of everything that I've shared with you that's happening in my world right now. But you'll see this on the screen. Three things. Three things that can, that can bring a discouraged soul. Number one is unresolved hurts. Number two is active sin. And number three is spiritual weakness. All of these play a part. The unresolved hurts, the people problems, the, you know, the, the, the problems that we run into where, where some people will not reconcile with you. In the body of Christ, we collectively have been all been given a ministry of reconciliation, reconciling people with God, with the Father through Jesus Christ, and reconciling relationships with others. Paul would tell the believer, he, said, he would say this in Romans 12 and 17, he would say, repay no one evil for evil, have regard for good things in the sight of all men. And then he gets into that place that we don't like to talk about because there is so much unresolved hurt that happens right here. He says, if it is possible, if as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men if it is possible. Why would he write it that way? Because he knows very well that, there, that it is absolutely impossible to reconcile with all people because not all people desire to live out, to walk in the framework of what God has said. And it has been taught this way, it's been said this way, and it's, it's, it, it goes beyond the scope of the pulpit. It goes into your life. Maybe you've heard it by, you know, it's, 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 it's a death by a thousand blows. It wasn't the one blow. It's a death by a thousand blows that happened. It's the small cuts. It's the small things. And so many of the, the things that drive our pastors out of the pulpit in more recent decades... It's the unresolved hurts. Because everybody claps, and you get the, sometimes the amens. Around here we say the go Jesus. But who is the next person that turns their back on you and slams the door in your face, pokes you in the eyeball, slaps you on the face, kicks you, criticizes you. Unresolved hurts. 
I've spoken to you about conditions of my life, but I want you to understand that I'm only using the, ele- the illustrations that are relevant to me. This is not minimizing your pain, your unresolved hurts, the things that people have done to you to, 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 to rock you back on your heels. Are, are you hearing what I'm saying this morning? I'm teaching you Psalm 42, but I'm giving to you the flavor of emotion, of the reality of our humanity, that we are just people. And as people, we get, we get put into these places, in these spots, in these positions where it's like, I can't hear God. I don't hear him. I don't see him. And this is not happening the way that I want it to happen and going the way that I want it to go. I'm speaking about your life right now, not mine. Where is God? You're not alone. Your experience is not something new to humanity or to the scriptures, and neither is mine. It doesn't make it any less painful. But it's in that wrestle is to where I learn to walk by faith that I can say, just like with you in your life, that you can say that God is good all the time. It's moving beyond the emotion of I don't want to do this or I won't do this to God, I trust you. And though you slay me, I trust you. I think that our I think that our Christian experience in this country, in this age, for many, is going to be narrowed down to just that. Can you say that? Or when it gets hard, like Jesus talked about in John chapter 6, verse 66, will you go back Will you abandon Jesus because you're trying to seek relief for your emotions as opposed to standing by faith on what God has told you? And you see that spills into that second area where a discouraged soul can happen, and that is active sin. Because Satan wants us to doubt God, and he wants us to turn away in a hopeless capacity. And God has spoken plainly to these things. Proverbs 13 and 12, it says this. You'll see it on the screen. He says, he says that hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. In other words, there might be tears in the nighttime, but joy comes in the morning. The faithfulness of your God causes the sun to rise and to set. And the scriptures tell us that he doesn't faint, he doesn't grow weary. And our desire to have a better life, our desire to grow in Jesus, our desire for good things, it will happen. You might be down. You know, some of these things that I've told you about my life in this moment, they may, have, they may have stirred up things in your moment. And you may be down. But because of Jesus, you're not out. You need to know that. You need to remember that. And the pain in the process only shows you that you're human. It only reveals that you might have a thick skin, but it just reveals that there's a soft heart within there, and that's what God uses. And Satan wants to grieve us. He wants us to be in this place of active sin. Why? 
so that he can break our fellowship with God. What? How could you say such a thing? I'm not sure I said it. But if you look at the screen here, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30 to 32. Paul says, he says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. Do not cause this sadness or pain or distress. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Well, how, 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 could I, how could I possibly grieve the Spirit of God? Well, an act of sin. Well, what does that look like? Well, let all bitterness, wrath, and anger, clamor, evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Okay. Well, what am I to do then outside of that? Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Well, I, I can see that, Jeff. And you usually talk a mile a minute. But today, you're much more thoughtful and restrained in your speech. Mm-hmm. A discouraged soul, the three things, unresolved hurt, active sin, and oh yeah, what's the last one? Spiritual weakness. Spiritual weakness. You see in spiritual weakness, uh, should you desire to look at the passage, it comes from a very, very, very busy church in Revelation chapter 2, verse 4. This busy church, the church that Timothy pastored, the church of Ephesus, they were busy. But a spiritual weakness sets in. How so? In Revelation 2 and 4, Jesus says as he's speaking to this seven churches here, and this is the first church. It's a good church. And Jesus says, nevertheless, I have this against you, that you have left your first love. You see, folks, discouragement. Discouragement can come in when there is no prayer, no word, no fellowship. We only see maybe one of these here in our text where he was out of fellowship with the people that he used to be in fellowship with. And yet when Jesus speaks to the church of Ephesus here in Revelation 2 and 4, he says, he says I have this against you that you have left. You didn't lose it. You left it. And as I've taught you before, this, this leaving your first love, it, it carries the impacts of three things. I think they'll have them on the screen. I could be wrong. But the word literally speaks about this stair-stepping thing. Stepping. Stepping. Just stepping down. Leaving your first love first shows up to that place of, for, of neglect. It's forgetting the word of God. And it moves to the second thing to where you abandon. It's like, well, you've neglected the word of God and now you're in this place where it's like, well, I'm not even gonna try to draw close to God. Every time I get close to God, it just goes bad. And that's what Satan wants to do. He wants that spiritual weakness to come in. And then the third side of, of leaving your first love, again, first is neglect, second is abandoned. It's a stair-stepping down, 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 down. Uh, the final one comes to des deserting. And that is stepping away because of a loss of interest. How many people do you know in your life that no longer go to church? Why? It's because they've left their first love. Well, this is super encouraging morning. Thank you for sharing this with me. <laughs> well, what's the way out of this? Well, that's the second idea. Verses 6 down through 11, back in Psalm 42. He says, my God, actually, let me start with now. Uh, so that's the end of verse five. He says, now I am, I am deeply discouraged, but I will remember you, even from distant Mount Hermon, the source of the Jordan. Those of you that went with Israel, you knew, you've seen that. You were right up there. You were right at the base of it. 
at Caesarea Philippi. From the land of Mount Mazar or the Hill Mazar, either one. He says, I hear the tumults of the, the raging seas as your waves and surging tides sweep over me. But, but each day, the, the Lord pours out his unfailing love upon me. And through each night, I sing his songs, praying to God who gives me life. Oh God, my rock, I cry. Why have you forgotten me? Why must I wander around in grief, oppressed by my enemies? Their taunts break my bones. They scoff. Where is this God of yours? Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. There's a declaration of faith in spite of the circumstances and the recognition of what is going on here in these verses 6 down through 11, that, that, that literally there is a turning of the tide and as he begins to look at this stuff right here, as he begins to move in this area, this expression of faith is being built upon the reality of what God has done, what God has given. The, the, the continual washing over of God's grace and the newness of that grace every single morning. And even though he was in this place of, of strong emotions and, and he couldn't hear God answering him, I've also wondered this about my life. And that is, how many times has God actually been speaking to me with his still, small voice, but I let it slip by? All because I won't be still. Mount Hermon, Mount Mazar, or the hill Mazar, again, the idea is just nothing more than the abundance of God's blessing. And if you can consider this, Maybe you can consider three things. That God knows best. He knows you better than anybody else because he created you. So maybe we can be encouraged to accept his plan and to move forward. And maybe we can consider that, that struggles refine us. And they teach us to be still when it hurts. And, and that is such an unnatural response because when you stub your toe, you smash your hand, you do all of that, there's a hurt that comes in. What do you do? Some of you speak a different language. <laughs> that's, that's not what we're highlighting here, okay? But, but, but if you can think about it being still when it hurts, struggles refine us. Maybe the third thing that you can consider is this third truth is, is never isolate yourself. Why? Because God uses people to express his love to you. Which is why, I'm not putting a legal trip on you, but, but this is why your attendance in the body of believers on a consistent week by week basis, you got six days, do whatever the heck you want to do. But come Sunday, Get your tail through that door and get in here. Because God is using you or he will use others for you. It should, there should be a reciprocity there. It should be a back and forth. And so we close our time here with idea number three. And that is helping hand. Psalm 43, one through five. I think I'm going to read it in the New King James. He says, Vindicate me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. Deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man. For you are the God of my strength. Notice this. Why do you cast me off? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? And he knew what was the remedy. Verse 3, he says, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me to your holy hill and to your tabernacle. Gang, when you feel absent, when you feel alone, please understand that the helping hand of God is right present with you. Because anytime you don't think that you can hear God speak, please realize that he has already spoken. 
Verse number three, the psalmist was saying, he was pleading with God, don't cast me off. Why am I going about mourning? Why, why are you letting the oppression of the enemy to get the better side of me? But he knew that, that it is God's word that leads him into God's presence. And may you understand that this morning that it is God's word that leads you into his very presence. Verse four, he says, then, then I will go to the altar of God, to God my exceeding joy, and on the harp I will praise you. There's that renewal of joy. And the final time, the third time between these two psalms, in Psalm 42 and 5, he asked the question, why are you cast down? Why are you discouraged? He said it again, Psalm 42 and 11. Why are you cast down? Why are you discouraged? But when he gets to the end of, of chapter 43 here in this particular spot in verse number 5, it's different. Why are you cast down? Why are you discouraged, O oh my soul? Why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God. For I shall yet praise him, the help of my continence and my God. Literally, the help means health. The health of my continence is, is God. That, that he understood. That the only hope that he had was to cling to, the, to an unchanging God was not to build his house upon the sinking sand, the fads of the moment that will fade, but to be anchored into the rock of the ages, Jesus Christ. He understood by faith at the end of this that while he still had questions, he knew that beyond those feelings, that the hope of his very soul, I shall yet praise God. And if this is as bad as it gets for you as a Christian, that's what's to be expected within this life. But what God has given to you, what God has given to the men and women who are believers in him, not to the hard-hearted people that call themselves Christians, and they're not. They show up to church, they serve in areas, they do all of this. They're not Christians. We have them around here. I don't, I don't do it to push them down. I do it to, to just, just express the reality. There are people in this room that need to get saved, and yet your face has been here for a long time. The Scriptures reveal to us final verse of the day. One, Psalm 130, verse 5. Scriptures reveal to us that God just wants us to trust his word and to walk by faith. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I do hope. It's only in his word.